All right, let's do it. We have a lot to cover today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, our workshop. Um, on it's called uh, Guarantee a Best Picture for your company. And there's a play on words there. We're actually going to be using a movie streaming company. So there's, uh, you know, if you if you didn't catch the 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 meaning behind the title, and you know, and to guarantee that best picture for your company, we're going to be using the converged analytics capabilities of Autonomous Database. So we have, a, like, as I said, we have a lot to cover. So I really would love to just jump right in. What we'll do is we'll start by introducing the team um, and then give a quick overview of what we mean by um, multi-model analytics in the database. We'll give you a, uh, an intro to this workshop and what you'll be doing with those analytics. And then we're going to jump right on. So probably spend about five minutes um, introducing the topics. So let's let's jump right in. Now, this is a, a live lab workshop, right? So we have, um, you know, f first of all, there is a, a, a you could you could do this using our, the free trial. You could even use this using um, go through this workshop using the always free because we'll be focused on autonomous database and that's part of always free. So this will all this workshop will fit within those constraints. But you could also run it in your own tenancy. You can run it on free tier. Um, you know, if if you want to start a free trial, you can go to the bit.ly link here, bit.ly uh, slash pi day dash free trial. And that will will take you to the sign up, and you get, I think it's about five hundred dollars or so worth of free credits to use um, cloud. Now, if you have any questions about uh, signing up for the the free trial, the best place to go is to our Slack channel. So you can see here we have uh, Bitly slash odevrel o d e v r e l dash Slack, and on that Slack channel, if you have any issues with actually signing up, that's the place to go. If you have questions, as we're going through this lab, through this workshop, you have the Q&A uh, button and just ask questions. And we have some great people here to, to help you out. Now, this lab, we'll, we'll show you this URL a few times, so don't worry if you don't catch it quite yet. But today's workshop is going to be uh, located at bit.ly slash adb dash analytics dash lab and again you'll see this in just a second if you miss this but that's that's where you go to get the actual workshop itself now let me introduce the team we have the a team here so um uh with us today we have uh, marcos aaron sibia he is our machine learning expert and david lap our um our spatial expert as well as expert on many other things. Um, Kevin, another guy, expert on pretty much everything. And Melly, I guess I could really say that about everybody. Melly too, just uh, people with a lot of experience. And Melly has a ton of experience here at Oracle working now, um, like focusing on our graph technology, which we'll be going through, but she's done so much more. Um, and again, the, the link is right below here. That's where we're, that's how you get to our lab. So, this is the team that will be supporting you. You have questions, they'll have answers. So please just go to the Q&A link if you have any questions as we're going through the lab. So what are we doing today? Well, so we start with the, the premise is we are MovieStream. Uh, MovieStream is a fictitious online movie streaming company. And the it, for MovieStream, their customer base is really been growing. It's been terrific. They, they generate tons of structured and unstructured data. What we're going to do in this session is demonstrate how you can use Oracle Cloud and Autonomous Database to be able to capitalize on that data, right? So better understand your customers, uh, better understand what they're doing, um, make a better user experience for them. And, and obviously, ultimately, the goal is to improve, you know, uh, improve prof profitability for movie stream. Now, the things that we're 
going to do is we're really going to bring the power of um, autonomous database and it has a multi-model platform and in case you don't know um, you know Oracle database supports lots of data types right everyone knows Oracle database stores numbers and text and whatnot in, in tables but also spatial JSON um, graph right so not only do we capture data in these different formats there's also specialized analytics that you can apply across these data types. And that's what we're going to be doing today, right? So today you may have um, uh, data in spatial, right? And then we'll say, hey, all right, well, we're going to want to do a, a, a promotion. Let's use a nearest neighbor. You know, uh, we have, we're going to be looking for a pizza place that's nearest to a customer, right? So spatial analytics. Or for graph, we're going to want to do recommendations. So we're going to apply a whom to follow graph algorithm to figure out who, what, what products, what movies should we be recommending to people, right? So you have, you store this data in multiple places and then you analyze that data holistically, right? So, you know, you're combining relational data with geospatial data with graph data and you can have that in one fully managed solution. And that's kind of what the power of autonomous database and what it brings to bear. So, you know, something that would be challenging if you're going to use specialized databases, it's very hard to bring all of that data together for analytics without going through a lot of specialized ETL, et cetera. So, so the, the, that's what we're going to be, to be doing. And specifically, we're going to start by deploying an autonomous database. That's our first lab. And once we deploy that autonomous database, we're going to integrate it with a data lake. We have data stored in object storage, Oracle object storage, and we're going to integrate that data with autonomous database. And we'll do it in multiple ways through uh, both our, our user, our, our UX, as well as through APIs. Next, will use SQL and advanced SQL capabilities over that data. And we're going to be doing SQL over JSON data, SQL over um, using SQL analytic functions to uncover some issues and possibilities. Next, we'll predict customer churn using machine learning and uh, a capability called AutoML. And then um, we will, the next step, there's a lot here, guys. The next step, I'm running out of breath. Uh, the next step is we'll use spatial to do those localized promotions that I mentioned, right? So we have, uh, we're going to identify potential churners. Let's make a specialized offer, a localized offer to them. So, you know, you don't want to make an offer to a customer that lives 160 miles away from a local pizza place. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, you can use spatial to, to really target those promotions. And then finally, we have really strong graph capabilities in autonomous database and we'll be using our notebook, our graph studio notebooks to um, use specialized graph algorithms to recommend movies um, based on behavior. Now, this is a lot, right? And so don't, don't worry if you can't get through it all today, right? I'm going to run through it and I'll be going through it. You can follow along and do this later. You can uh, try to keep up with me. Uh, again, we have great people to help you out, but this lab is available 24-7, 365 days a week. You can run this lab anytime. This link that you're going to will be available to you. Um, so do not worry if you can't get through the whole thing. So again, let's, let's get us started. Um, the first thing you want to do is open a browser and you'll probably want two browsers, uh, side by side. And I'll, I'll show you that. And then go to this bit.ly link, uh, bit.ly slash ADB dash analytics dash lab. That's going to take you to the actual lab itself in your other browser window, go to cloud.oracle.com and then log in to your tenancy. 
Now, before we actually do this, I do have a question, actually two poll questions, which would be really helpful for us to understand. Um, and I have actually none, never done poll questions before in Zoom. So, um, Marcos, are you here? Yes, sir. Marcus, do you, do you want to run through the, the poll in terms of executing it? Or do we have it? Do we have them set up? Yes, we do. Um, so I think Nick, the host need to, to uh, poll number one. Up. There we go. Do people see it? All right, guys. So the first question is, how do you want to participate in today's workshop, right? Do you want to work through the labs now? right and, and try to keep up or um do you want to just learn what the workshop has to offer and then you could do this on your own later and then oh these polls seems like they may, oh the sec this that's question number one the second question is what do you hope to gain from this uh you have, do you have an active project and hopefully this workshop content will help. Is this for your own personal edification or um, really just trying to explore and better understand how my organization could benefit from analytics? So I'll give you just a couple minutes to answer those questions. Well, I guess the third question shouldn't be there. <laughs> That, that's right. supposed to be at the end, having completed right. this session. You haven't started it yet. Sorry, that was supposed to be a poll question that's going to be delivered later. Sorry, guys, I'm kind of new to polls. All right, I'll give it uh, 15 more seconds to answer these questions. But it looks like the vast majority of folks want to learn, and then they'll do it. Them, they'll do this lab themselves later that's 80 percent of people over 80 percent um which is great for those of you who want to do it now again it, it's it's going to be fast paced so if you can't keep up do not worry you can do it later um terrific okay so thank you the poll questions were terrific let's let's get going so go to my next window. Oh, you know, I introduced everybody, but I didn't introduce myself. My name is Marty Gubar, <laughs> and I'm from the product management team for Autonomous Database. So, hi, everybody. Um, now, let me get this out of my way. So, the, on the left-hand side here, I have my, uh, I've had, let's take that Bitly link, right? And we'll go to bit.ly slash uh, ADB Analytics Lab. And that's going to take us to the actual content itself. And then you decide how you want to run it. Do you want to run it on your free trial, run it uh, on your own tenancy, or run an always free? It runs in all of these. And frankly, for those of you, I know it's like 80% of you who, who aren't running it right now, we have another, we'll have a fourth option for you after this is complete, which is you'll be able to run this in what we call um, a green button which we will provide an environment for you. So in case, you know, you don't have one. So I'm gonna go into, uh, I'll, I'll do the launch, the free trial. So that, that takes us to the lab itself. So hopefully you can see this here now on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I went to cloud.oracle.com, right? So cloud.oracle.com, and that takes me to the login to cloud. And this is where you specify your tenancy. Mine is called ADWC 4 p.m. Hit next. And then we log on using our um, single sign-on. And I had logged in previously, so it just logged me right back in. Okay. So we have our environment up, right? I have the two windows and, you know, I, I like to maximize both and run them side by side. So it's easy to go back and forth and to make the sides bigger and smaller. Now, the first part, see, is so on the lab itself, you'll notice we have, um, or in the workshop, we have 
these different labs. We'll start with lab number one, which is uh, provision your instance. And this, the, 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 honestly, the longest thing for, for doing this part is just actually the deployment itself might take a minute, but this is a really fast operation. Now in, uh, in OCI information, you're oftentimes your resources, your databases, your networks, your, um, Hadoop, your Hadoop clusters, et cetera, are organized into compartments. Think of those as being, um, just, you know, places to store your, your resources and to organize. And maybe you have a dev compartment, you have a, uh, production compartment, maybe an application compartment. So you define, um, access privileges based on compartments, right? So, so if you don't have a compartment, you can create one now. Uh, if you do have a compartment, you can just use that compartment, right? There's no, you, you, you just decide, but you basically just give a compartment a name. And now you put your resources in those names or in that, in that compartment. Here we're suggesting, hey, why not call it movie stream, right? So you can create a movie stream compartment, which I already have. And then once you have that compartment defined, we're now going to create an autonomous database in that compartment. So you go to the hamburger menu on the top left and you set, select autonomous database. And if you want to search, you can, you know, you can just search for, uh, the, the, um, service that you want. Cause we have, we have a lot of services on OCI. So that's part one. You pick the compartment where you want to put it and you also select the region, right? So we have lots of regions. You probably have one, like just a couple listed here. Um, but I'm going to put mine in, um, in San Jose and I can show here all those, uh, autonomous databases that are currently available. And now what I want to do is create a new one, right? So I'm going to create a new one. I'll call it movie stream or actually I call it, I think they give it a different name, uh, here in the, the lab, but it, the name actually doesn't really matter. Um, you can call it anything that you want, frankly. So we're at task three already. We're almost done with the first lab. Uh, it's called my quick start, right? So I call this my quick start. You can't put spaces in here. So you have to, but this is, this is what people will end up seeing. And then you give the, the actual name to it. Now there's other options, right? This is uh, optimized for data warehousing or transaction processing, or maybe you're building a custom app. You can do this on shared infrastructure, and that's what we're going to do here today. You can specify, uh, well, the database version is going to be 19C. That's what I want you to select on always free. You may, you may have options to select different versions. Um, here you have 19C and you can also specify your CPU count. Now this can change any time, right? You don't have to worry about that. Oh, okay. I baked in two OCPUs. Um, well, I have to stick to that. No, you don't. And not only that, we'll, we'll review like different options for, for that. And, um, then you enter in your password for the admin user. So every time you create an autonomous database, there's an administrative user. That's the user you use to, um, specify, uh, to create new users, et cetera. Uh, next you say, well, how am I going to be accessing this? And there's a lot of flexibility, frankly, in how you can deploy. We're going to focus on just secured access from everywhere. Um, but you can have much more fine grained, um, secure security to accessing that. And then you guys should pick license included. I'm going to pick, bring your own license and click create. So we're now creating an autonomous database, right? So this is, this is the, uh, this may be your first database that you've been, you've created. And this takes probably about two minutes or so. So what, what is going on under the covers, right? So we're creating this database. It's actually deploying it on Exadata infrastructure. So it's a highly tuned database. We specify two CPUs, which we'll be able to change. We can change this manually. 
we can put it on a schedule and say, hey, up, you know, make it uh, when I'm doing my ETL or Monday mornings, <laughs> Monday mornings when people come in, I want to change automatically change that to 10. Or we can do what's called auto scaling and auto scaling. You could keep it at two. And then as the workloads increase, it can triple the amount of compute automatically without you having to engage. Right. And so that's really nice. It, it'll auto scale, handle that workload, and then it'll scale back down as the workloads decrease. Right. So that's kind of a nice thing. We also have auto uh, scaling for storage. So there, to be clear, there's a separation of storage and compute. Right. You you can increase and decrease the storage um, independently of of one another. Um, so, so now my autonomous database is deployed. We have now the available and we've just finished our first lab. So pretty easy. You know, one other thing that we didn't even talk about are things like, Hey, if I want to enable data guard, it's, it's very, very simple now to, you know, through ADB, it'll handle data guard will enable failover, for example, in case there's a problem, um, with a region or with your instance. So. So this is cool, right? We created our first autonomous database. We can, you know, give ourselves a round of applause. And hey guys, uh, Melly or, or Kevin, any, any questions from folks? That's that we should Not share? Yet. No. Okay. All right, so part one, we've, we've deployed our autonomous database. Part two now is we're going to, um, create a user, start loading some data. <laughs> Let's start using it, right? So I'm going to go to lab two and I'm going to create a new database user. We're going to call that database user movie stream. And to create users, we're going to go to our database actions. And because we've just logged in and we just created this as the admin user, it's, it, you don't even have to specify your ID and password. It's going to associate it with your OCI user, right? So now I am logged in um, to what we call our database tools. And there's a lot of different tools available. You can go to the SQL worksheet. You can start working with JSON. You can build an Apex application. What we're going to do is start by creating a new user because you don't really want to have everyone log in necessarily as the admin user. That's a powerful user, right? So we're going to log in as movie stream and give it a password. Now, there's a few things that I want to make sure you do. One is make sure you say, hey, we're going to give this person unlimited quota. If you don't do this, they we're going to be creating tables, loading data, and we're saying, yeah, this person can load as much as they want. Right. You can, and you can restrict that as you, as you could see. The second thing that's really important here after, after your user ID and password is let's enable features like machine learning graph. And we want to provide web access to, for this user done, right? I've just created my first user. Now. That's how you could do stuff through the UI, but we thought it would be also useful to show you how to do things through the APIs, right? And, and if you know Oracle SQL, this is exactly the same, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to this hamburger menu and we're going to grant things individually. So we're going to do some fine grain permissions here. So I'm going to go to the SQL tab under development or the SQL worksheet. And for those of you who use SQL developer, this should look pretty familiar. It's a web-based version of it, right? And you know, we don't have any tables defined. You would see a list of tables here before, but because we're going to be using some scripts later, the movie stream user, you know, the way Oracle security works is that when you're running things through scripts, you actually have to do fine grain grants, right? Like I'm going to grant execute on some packages. I'm going to uh, grant the ability to create tables and views. So 
copy and paste. So click the copy button, paste it into this worksheet. And then you'll see on the tools here, you can say run script. And when you run script, it's going to automatically run through every single item here. And you can see that all the grants have succeeded. Right. So what I've done is I've created that movie stream user using the UI. And the next thing um, I'm doing is um, just giving some more fine grained access to it. And at this point, now that movie stream has all the privileges they need, we'll log on as movie stream. So we're going to log off as admin. So top right, you can see that we can sign out. And now we'll sign in again as movie stream. And I don't trust that the automatically filled in password. So guys, we'll be spending a lot of time in these tools. All right. So now we're in the database actions homepage. So we we have our user, we've logged in, we have data in the data lake and we want to load that data. So we're going to go to the data load tool, right? And in the data load tool, the first thing, so we're actually on task four now of, of our um, lab and we're going to create what's called a cloud location because you can load data from different places. You could load data from Oracle Object Store, which is what we're going to be doing. You could load data from, or actually the first thing we're gonna do is create a cloud location. You can do this in multiple ways. So click on cloud locations first. Sorry for, sorry for being confusing. We're gonna create, a, we're gonna click on, or create a link to a cloud storage. Again, that cloud storage could be Google. It could be S3. It could be Azure. In our case, it's Oracle, right? And you, you, you set up the credentials that are required to access that store and you name it, right? So that way, you know, you can refer to this connection easily later. It turns out that this, this data that we're looking, we're looking at, it's in a public bucket. So we don't need a credential, but we do need the URL. And so if we look on lab, um, where are we lab four or task four, I should say in lab two, configure the object storage connections. We're going to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have this link to this bucket in the object store. And now we'll just click create. So now we have a named connection called, um, movie stream gold, uh, or maybe I call it movie stream to, to that object storage bucket in, um, in, uh, Oracle cloud infrastructure. Okay. Awesome. I now had that link. Now I want to just start loading data from that bucket, right? So if you think about an object store, an object store is just a bunch of files organized into folders, buckets and folders. So I'm going to go, let's go back to the hamburger menu and say, let's hit data load. We saw this before. So I'm going to load data and I could load data from a local file. Let's say I had an Excel file or something I could upload. I could load it from another database. Um, in that case, it would be using our database links. Or I could upload for, or I could load data from that cloud store that we just defined and click next. Oh, I did call it. So in movie stream gold, this is our gold zone. This is where our uh, data that we can trust is because we also have a landing zone, which as data that landed from various sources, it went through an ETL process and it landed in this gold zone. We also have a sandbox for uh, our data science users. So I, these are folders that are in my object store. And what I want to do is I'm going to load a couple of them, right? So if we go back to, we're here now on, um, task five, load data from the object store, I'm going to load customer contact and you just drag it. So select it and drag it to the right and says, do you want to load it? Yeah, I do. 
And I want to also load movie genres. In this case, there's one object, there's one file. But, you know, if I were to load customer sales, you'll notice it's partitioned by month. And there's parquet files in each of these, right? In this case, these files happen to be, um, I think they're all, they're either parquet or CSV. I, I actually can't remember. But if you look at it, here's the source columns coming from uh, the file, and here's where we're targeting it, and this is the data types. So all this was derived by introspecting the file. So for a CSV file, this is a good estimate. For a Parquet file, like it just knows, right? Parquet has a, um, a defined schema that's just used. So not only is this going to load the data, you'll notice, and I should have said, it's also going to create a table called customer contact. So you have different options, right, on that data load. You can create a table, replace data in a table, drop a table and create new table. So you have merge data. So you have different options when you're running this data load. In this case, I don't have any tables yet. So we're going to hit run. And the job is now running and the job is creating those tables. And then it's loading those data, those tables from, from the source. And this will probably take about 20 seconds or so. Any any questions out there? No, until now, I don't see a question. There was a question about the link to the Slack channel, but I think Tor was able to clarify that one. Great, great, okay. So this now that you have these checkboxes, it means it's been loaded, right? And if we go back into genre, you can see, okay, here's the two, this is the table, here's the two columns. Um, and here's the genre IDs. So we just we just loaded into the database, action, adventure, biographies, comedies. These are all the movie genres. We just loaded data from the object store, from our data lake into the database. Drag and drop, really easy, right? Well, oftentimes you wanna write scripts, right? And we're going to have a, a script that's going to do a ton of stuff. So let's do that next in task six. And to do this, you know, people who are familiar with the Oracle database, we have PLSQL, right? And it's a super useful language for doing uh, work on your data. I'm going to go to the SQL tab again under development. And this brings us back to that uh, SQL developer web. UI. And you'll notice that genre and contact table. These are the two tables that we just created. Well, okay, I, I, I'm not, I don't want you to necessarily worry about the code here. I'll, I'll explain it a little bit, but copy this code snippet. So we are in task six, load and link more data using SQL scripting for our uh, right here. So lab two, task six. And copy this and just paste it in. And this probably takes about four minutes. And hit run script. So what is this doing under the covers? Well, we actually have a lot of da more data that we wanted to load. So um, we have some scripts that we actually loaded into Object Store. They're PL SQL scripts. We're going to move into JIT. I haven't had a chance to change that. What's pretty cool now is that Autonomous Database enables uh, has APIs now to be able to automatically synchronize with a JIT repo. So we'll be updating this code to actually automatically synchronize with a JIT repo, which is cool. And it will, it will generate your PL SQL procedures and whatnot in your database. So that's what this code will be up to do. This, that's what it'll do. But under the covers, what's happening is it's downloading these PL SQL procedures. And now it's loading customer sales. It's creating a graph. It's creating spatial indices. It's it's building a bunch of stuff that um, we we have another uh, lab where you can actually see a lot more. Um, this is, it's called the, the deep dive version of this lab. Um, this is the, you know, we try to get this lab done in, in 90 minutes. That one takes a bit longer. But it's going through and it's 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 loading all of this data right now. And if we go back into autonomous database, 
just this tab as as this is running right you can go into performance hub for example and see like the activity that's going on in in our database right and um you know we we're running this on low there's there's multiple um uh, you can connect to autonomous database via multiple service connections right there's low medium and high low is what you use um you know, like if you're building dashboards if you're querying the database and you're going to have lots of concurrency you want those users to connect on low if you get connect on high you get tons of parallelism right that you then have uh, the concurrency is lower and there's actually also a medium and medium is is right in between between the two so here we can see this is great for your administrators right who want to see and understand what's going on and they want to do sql monitoring etc right so a really nice you know oracle's got so many capabilities around performance monitoring and whatnot so that's the kind of thing that you can see um you can see here all right let's go back and see what's happening here oh you know what else i could do uh seeing the, the close button oh here it is close the other thing you, we could do here under more actions, you know, we talked about things like, hey, I want to, <laughs> my dogs are moaning. I think I'm boring my dogs. Um, let's say you wanted to increase or decrease your CPU utilization. You know, this is where you could say, yeah, I'm, I'm using two now, but I'd like to bump it up to four. Or I can enable or disable auto scaling, right? So, you know, right now we've enabled auto scaling. If you're on always free, you, you, there is no auto scaling, so you won't be able to do this. But because I've enabled auto scaling here, when we're doing this database load, if I had run this on a higher, um, I went into low, which means I don't get much in the way of parallelism. But if I logged into a higher um, as an as administrator, like into the high service, this could bump up during this data load from two to six. CPUs using auto scaling, right? And so that way it'll just make the workload run faster. And then when we're done with the workload, it would go back down to two. So that's that's pretty nice. And and the other thing is, um, again, there's a separation of storage, storage and compute. So if we wanted to increase or decrease our storage, we could we could do that here. Um, let's go back and see where this is at this point. So. This has been running. Ah, perfect timing. It's done. <laughs> so look at the work that it just went through, right? So it did all of this behind the scenes. Um, it it went in and it loaded uh, a pizza location table, a customer segment table, a customer contact table, customer promotions, customer sales. Uh, it, it went in and created... Um, our constraints on on um, on our tables to enable JSON. It did. Uh, it created a graph. It created different um, uh, spatial indices. So there's tons of stuff that went through. You know, added spatial metadata, etc. So that's that's what just went on through here. So all right, let's summarize. Now, and I can hit refresh, and you can now see all the different objects, all the different tables that have been created. So this is pretty cool, right? We just uh, went through the process of, we provisioned our ADB, we have uh, created a new user, we went through the UI and we um, created tables graphically, and then we, and we loaded them. And then, then we did the same thing, but through the APIs and did a lot more work, right? And that completes this second lab. So I've now integrated with the data lake and I have data that's coming from my data lake and now it's available to me in, um, 
in my database, in, in my autonomous database. So now let's start running some queries. Let's go to, uh, and, and we're going to jump through this. We're not necessarily going to do all of them because we're going we're gonna to be st stuck for time. But we're in our SQL worksheet. And let's just hit the, um, the clear button to get rid of some of this stuff so we can see stuff better. Um, and we're going to use SQL to analyze data. And the first thing that we're going to do is, and well, I'll skip around a little bit. We're going to create a view. And what is this view doing? Well, you know, there's a, a star schema here. And a star schema, you usually have what we call dimension tables or lookup tables like movie, genre, time, customer. And they're linking to or they're joining to customer sales. So this has the keys. And then you join these like a cust ID field. This has a cust ID field. You join to that table, and then you can say, oh, okay, I got the cust. This only has the cust ID. This has the customer name, first name, last name, gender, et cetera, like all these different attributes associated with the customer. So we're going to create a view that's actually joining these different um, these different tables just to make it a little bit easier to run, right? So we're joining on day, joining on a customer, joining on genre now oh don't highlight something and then hit run because then it's only gonna run that little um <laughs> that little segment so just put your mouse anywhere and hit the run button and it's going to run that one statement and now we have our fact our view defined okay now let's scroll down now that we have our view with a join you know for those of you who don't know, and I'm just going to do a really quick example, this is actually using what we call inner joins. Inner joins mean there's going to be, there has to be a match on the um, the things, the, the fields that are being joined in order for the table results, a row to be returned for that, for that result, right? What, what do I mean by that? Let's learn a little bit more about joins. So... I'm going to copy. Let's go to task number three, learn more about joins. And we'll delete this. So again, hit that little garbage can. It gets rid of our script. And I'll just paste this in. This is doing an inner join. Right? I am joining genre to um, inner joining it to our sales fact table. Right? And... You know, I can scroll through this and I see all my results. One of the, the genres that's actually available is called news. You don't see news here, right? It's because it's doing an inner join. And there was no, nothing in the fact table. There was no sales on news in the fact table. So it literally fell out, right? You don't, you don't see it as a result. Now, if you want to use an outer join... Let me run this. So we're doing what's called a full outer join. So in this case, it turns out we have this genre called news. It didn't create, it didn't exist in the fact table, but it's going to manufacture that row, right? And and actually say, well, yeah, the the value is zero. So to the the whole point around this is that there's a lot of powerful capabilities in terms of how you want to combine data. And in this case, a full outer join, like in some cases you may want this to come back. It's really dense. You think about it as being densifying your data, but a lot of times you don't, right? And most of the time you probably don't. In this case, we did want to see it. So we did an outer join and then it was able to densify and manufacture that road. So that's that row. So that's a little, a little uh, kind of, example of, of, of different ways of combining information and, and why you might want to do it differently depending on, on the use case. Now, when you're running your queries in ADB, um, I'll get rid of this again. And we're now on task four, explore with fast sales performance. This is a pretty basic query, right? It's running your sales, uh, looking at sales by year and by quarter in total. Right, and this is for 2020. And it took a, I don't know, 
0.16 seconds. Now, if you run it the same thing again, just the exact same thing, and think about dashboards, right? You have dashboards that, um, you know, you have lots of users in the beginning of the day, they're gonna be running the same queries. So what ADB does is it has a, it'll cache it, right? And it's gonna do, um, it's gonna produce the result from the cache as opposed to having to re-execute this whole thing. So we've optimized ADB for, you know, to enhance the experience when you have lots of users who are um, running queries, right? And that's why ADB is really good at handling high concurrency as in the databases, right? And so result cache is an example of pull data out of a cache as, as opposed to running an expensive query. And, and it's going to be, in this case, it's probably 15 times faster. You know, your mileage will vary in terms of the, the performance boost. But anyway, that's, that's kind of one of the nice things that as Autonomous Database just does this for you. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to tune it. It's tuned for you. Okay, let's jump to task seven, where we're going to find our important customers. Um, so in task seven, this is kind of interesting. We're going to do what's called a customer RFM query, recency, frequency, and monetary analysis. And we're gonna break it into different pieces. So let's copy, if we go again to task seven, find your, our most important customers. I'm just gonna copy that and paste it in here. And then we'll describe it and hit run. So this is saying, okay, I'm gonna select some customer attributes and then I'm going to bin my customers into five, five bins. We'll call this, so RFM stands for recency, frequency, and monetary analysis. Here we're binning our customers based on revenue by what they've actually spent, right? And it's putting them into five bins. If you're in bin number five, you're a high spender. If you're in bin number one, not so much, right? Kind of a lower spender. So here, let's make a little more space. You can see that uh, Perrin is a big spender and Akira, not not very much, right? Not, not a high, from our perspective, you know, not the highest value customer for us because they're not a big spender, but we should turn them into a high value customer and have hopefully increase their spend, right? Okay, so these are customers that spend a lot. Well, let's get some more information about those customers. I really wanna get a better understanding of my customers, right? So I'm gonna remove that and now add two more bins, uh, a recency bin and a frequency bin. So now we're looking at it by saying, okay, when is the last time this customer had looking at the max, when was the last time they've hit our site and how frequently have they been hitting our site? So in this case, this customer ID, uh, you know, hasn't been around uh, recent, recently and hasn't been a frequent user. Let's pull it all together now, right? So we know their recency, we know the count, how, how frequent a user have they been? Well, what I really wanna know is for these high value customers, let's see. Uh, so we have Accra hasn't been around in a while. So I'm actually running this, I just blended these two concepts and I'm ordering by those who have been big spenders but their free recency is one, where did they go, <laughs> right? So these are customers who are big spenders had been coming to our site quite a bit and have, haven't come to our site in a while. And we potentially are losing them <laughs> or lost them, right? And we wanna figure out why, right? And, and do a little more work on that. All right. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep that thought because now we're gonna 
you know, in a, in a future, in, a, in just a few minutes, we, these are people that we've already lost and we're going to want to predict churn to prevent this from happening, right? And that's, that's what uh, a big task that we're going to have in just a bit. Now, before I do that, though, there's also some interesting things with regards to querying data that's in JSON format. And I don't know if you've heard, we have like an entire autonomous JSON database that has like a Mongo API, right? That you can use to build applications over. And it's, it's more of a document interface instead of a SQL interface, right? So we have what we call, we'll call JSON. It's not unstructured, it's really semi-structured, right? And by that, I mean, here is what a JSON document looks like in case of the, for those of you who don't know, right? You have attribute pairs. I have this movie ID, its title is big. Uh, its opening date was June 3rd of 1988. And it also, these are simple, at, basically attribute value pairs, but then you have more complex things like cast, which is an array, crew, well, the producer was James Brooks and Gary Ross and the director is Penny Marshall, right? So you have complex data types as well as simple data types. And the nice thing about JSON is that it's ultimately flexible, right? You're not burning um, a schema into this. It's, you know, whatever, you, know, you could just add new attribute value pairs and that's, that's not a problem. So how do you query this? Well, it turns out we, we have some data in JSON format, and let's copy this. We have 3,800 records in this view called JSON movie data. And this is actually EXT, it's an external table. This is actually pointing at data that is on um, object store. This data isn't even living in the database, right? So now if I wanna select from this table, so I'm gonna select star from this table, just the first 10 records, you can see what it looks like. This is exactly, this is coming directly from the file on object store. This is. ADB dynamically going against the object store and fetching this data. And you can see that it's in JSON format, which frankly is not super easy for SQL tools to query. How do you query this? Well, Oracle has a really rich JSON parsing capabilities, right? So I'm, I can go in here and now say, well, the column is called doc. I have a movie ID attribute. I have a, a title attribute. Um, if we if we were to scroll, you know, there's a, a title, an opening date, a budget, all these different fields. We'll just refer to the attribute here. And now we're looking at this data in tabular format, right? Which is exactly what, <laughs> you know, uh, tools want to use, right? So now you can actually join this data to sources, et cetera, right? So you can join this data to fact tables, wherever you want to join it to. And here is an example of saying, well, I'm going to join it to my fact table. So I have my movie data, my title coming from Jason. This is actually on object storage. It's not even in the database. And then I'm combining it with a fact table that's in the database. And I'm doing my group by title. And I'm getting my top, these are my top 10 movies based on sales. So we literally just, without you having to worry about it, right? We blended data coming from object store with data that's coming from the database, the data that's in object store is actually in a semi-structured format, right? Yet we're able to combine it with data that's in very structured format, right? Tabular data. And we now have our result. And this is something that Tableau or um, 
analytics cloud can very easily consume, right? And start doing more sophisticated analysis over. There's a bunch more, I'm not, I'm gonna skip over these, but we have like more sophisticated JSON queries that you can run through. Um, it it, it kind of deals with like, how do you deal with arrays, right? Because if you have an array for a movie, you know, you wanna be able to potentially, instead of having an array, you may want a row for each array. And so we have capabilities for doing that, like right? for transforming those complex types. So I'm gonna leave it to you. You can, again, this lab is available to you. You can run this anytime you want. So I'm gonna let you uh, run this on your own. And there's also tons of other labs that use JSON and whatnot that would also be interesting. But I wanna make sure I get to some of these other things that are really important. Now we had run into a situation, right? Where we saw that we had some customers who were high value customers that looked like they were going to churn or, or, or had churned already, right? And because, or we think they have, right? They haven't spent much money. They were used to be big spenders, but they haven't come to our site in a long time. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to go into machine learning and we wanna get in front of this. And what we wanna do is say, well, let's predict customers that may churn in the future. And to do that, we're gonna go back to the autonomous database service console and, or the, the um, OCI console, and we're gonna click on the service console. And we hadn't actually explored the service console before, but the service console gives you different types of analytics or your, um, not analytics, but like uh, management capabilities for your database. And if you go to the development tab, you'll see that we can launch into machine learning. And this is gonna take just a minute, but what it's doing is it's, and oh, I'm sorry, login is movie stream and your user, I'm gonna hope I got the password right this time. Yeah. So what it's doing is it's actually launching um, the machine learning uh, experience. Right, and there's different parts to this experience. One is we're going to define a model using AutoML, and that AutoML model is going to say, we're gonna create, we're gonna look at our customers and predict those, create a model that will help us predict those that might churn. And then we'll go into our notebook and say, okay, now that we predicted those that might churn, let's, um, score them and find out, uh, you know, which, you know, which, so we have the model of those are, are, might churn, and now we're gonna apply that to our data set and figure out, okay, of those customers, who, who are we worried about? So let's go to task one in, um, and again, if you click on lab five, USML, use OML to predict churn. And then we're gonna go to task one understand customer churn. Under the quick actions in machine learning, you see uh, AutoML. And so we're gonna go into that now and we're gonna create an AutoML experiment. Okay, so basically what we're doing as part of this experiment is we're going to be looking at, um, where is it? Here we go. So as part of this experiment, we're going to measure the activity in the older data in the past, and we're gonna build this model to say, okay, based on this activity in the past, and then we'll have a little bit of a buffer, do they have uh, some activity or no activity? And this is what we're going to train the model on, right? To figure out if somebody is going to churn. So based on that past activity, with bunch of different attributes that we're going to be looking at. And then we're gonna use that model to predict into the future who has a pr high probability of inactivity going forward. Okay, so it's kind of thinking about this as being this moving, this moving window. 
All right, so let's now create our experiment. So the first part is understand churn. Let's scroll down here. We, we've clicked on our use AutoML. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a model. Let me just get this out of the way so it's easier to see. I'm going to create a new machine learning model. And we'll call it um, churn, ah, churn prediction. That's nice. And you can give it anything, any anything you want predicts potential churn. And we we've, we've ahead of time created this table called movie stream churn. This is uh, a table that's been updated and has kind of like joined together multiple columns. We went through like a little bit of a prep stage to add columns to that table, et cetera, to help us predict churn. And, and, and the thing that we want to predict is if this person, so there's a column in that table called is churner, that's what we want to predict. And we want to predict that for every customer. Okay. Now, the other thing that we want to look at is how many models do we want to evaluate? And we're, because we're running on like a CPU, we'll pick uh, two, right? So we'll evaluate two models and, or we'll come up with two models and we're going to pick uh, for faster results, okay? So, as opposed to better accuracy. Faster results is what we want to do for this lab. Better accuracy might be good if you have more time. And what it's doing is it's now starting that experiment using those settings that we've just specified. And this probably takes about a minute or so. Marcos, do you want to jump in and, and kind of share what might be going on behind the scenes? Sure. So behind the scenes, uh, what you guys can see that uh, that is happening is we're uh, actually doing um, uh, the first analysis, right, is the algorithm selection. And then we're going to do uh, an adaptive sampling to see whether, you know, we need to sample the data or balance, right, the churners versus non-churners. And then we do a feature selection where we choose, you know, what are the best features out of those, you know, original 200 different features you might have, right, to predict the churns. So right now, um, the environment uh, already, uh, the AutoML UI selected the two top uh, algorithms, right? So decision trees and random forest. And now uh, it's actually running the decision tree, checking what's the best, you know, accuracy, right? That it can obtain by tuning the model. And then it's going to start tuning the random forest. And at the end, basically what you have is, you know, your champion model, right? What's the best one that uh, you can use? Right. Thank you. Marcos is the man. So when you look at this across all the models, right, here's many of the features um, that it looked at, right? So this came from that, that table that was prepared. And what it discovered across the different models at age, average discount, gender, uh, credit balance, like these are the things that are most, um, have the most influence right? Features with the most importance as to whether or not somebody is going to churn. And if you look at this, right, and you look at, look at the accuracy of the model, right, we have um, decision tree, which just seems like it's just a little bit more accurate than the random forest. And if we look at the specific attributes for um, the decision tree, you can see that the person's age, their gender, um, do they watch thriller movies or what was their education? These seem to be the highest impact attributes. And in applying this model, right, you can see that it's pretty accurate in terms of uh, whether or not if someone was not predicted to churn or they were predicted to churn and they did, it had about a 95% accuracy rate, uh, ratio, ratio. And predicted to churn and not like a false positive it's less, than, it's less than 4%. What does that mean to me, that less than 4%? It means, well, I may be applying a, uh, a promotion <laughs> and 
yeah, I may be sending that promotion to somebody who wasn't going to churn anyway. But it, I don't think it's really going to cost me a ton. Right? So this is a, a pretty decent model. And we're going to use that model now. And we're going to actually give it a name. So the name of this model we'll call um, churn pred. And this name matters <laughs> because we're going to be using this name later for scoring, right? So we have this new name called churn pred. And the next thing we wanna do is um, deploy the model and score. Okay, so here we'll go to our notebook. Oh, I, I, we actually need to import a notebook. So you can see right under task three, it says click here to download this notebook that we're going to be going through. So I'll put that into my downloads directory. Scoring It's called scoring customers with churn. And now that I've downloaded that notebook, I'm going to import. So we, we pre-built a notebook for you to make things easier. So in my downloads, I have this scoring customers with churn and you'll now see this new notebook available, right? So everyone hopefully has this new notebook that's been downloaded and now you can just simply open that notebook. And this is good, the, the, launching the notebook takes just a minute or so. How are we doing for time, guys? Uh, I think <clears throat> we have about more, what is it, 22 minutes left? Oh, we're good. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Terrific. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to score our customers. And this is the machine learning notebook. And our machine learning notebook has uh, different types of interpreters, right? So. Uh, here we're using the markdown interpreter, um, and you can, you can select which interpreters you want to use or not, right? So I'm just going to use this medium interpreter. So they're saying like, uh, high, we're connecting via high. That is like, you get the most concurrency, best performance. I'm sorry, the least, con high is the least concurrency, most, you get the most, uh, parallelism. I'm just going to go with, with medium here. Now, let's step through this. What we want to do is create a table called latest potential churners. So the first thing, if, it, if that table existed, we'll just drop it. Because we're going to create that table right now. So as you can see, there's a... So in a notebook, a notebook is comprised of paragraphs. And these paragraphs, you know, you see it's notebooks are awesome. I, I, here's what I love about notebooks. They're very easy to use. They're very good at explaining things, um, sharing information. If you want to do hardcore development and, and you know, would I rather use SQL developer? Yeah. Or would I rather use, uh, you know, VS code with Python? Yeah, I think that those would be better. But, but this is good when you want to certainly explain things and share things and run multiple languages in the same environment, right? Because we can run multiple languages within here. So on this next step, we're going to create a new table called latest potential churners. And we'll just click run. So we're going to run this paragraph. And what's it doing? Well, for every customer ID, it's running that we created that model called uh, churn prediction, right? Churn pred. And it's going to use the columns from the, the movie stream churn table to predict whether or not somebody is going to churn, right? So it does the prediction, and then it also gives you the prediction probability that they're going to churn, right? So now when we run the query uh, select star from our latest potential churners, and uh, we'll just select one a 1% sampling. This is kind of cool. For those of you who don't know, in a table, you can say, look, I just want a sample. I just want a random 1% sample. And so this is a random 1% sample of this Turner's table. And here's the prediction of my different customer IDs that they're going to potentially churn. So these are customers 
that we we may want to that we may worry about. You can go on and on here, right? Like maybe you want to combine this with customer value, right? So not only do you want to, because remember we're doing ML, we also have the sales transactions. So if you want to prioritize those customers that are going to churn, simply multiply the churn potential that they're going to churn, if they're going to churn, with their, with their revenue or with their views, right? And now you have kind of a ranking of high value customers that are also going to potentially churn. Just, uh, you know, one thing that you can do, right? There's, there's lots of stuff that you can do. But here we, uh, we've kind of identified those who are going to churn and, um, you know, we want to act upon that. Well, what do we want to do? How do we want to act upon that? Well, let's run a promotion, right? So our promotion is going to be like for our customers that are potentially going to churn, we're going to give them some pizza, right? So let's go to lab six. And this is where we're now going to use our spatial capabilities in the database. And we'll go back to, hopefully you still have that tab open for um, the SQL worksheet, right? Otherwise you can go to the hamburger menu, right? And go to uh, the SQL worksheet. And we're going to go back to the SQL worksheet and say, all right, let's start running some spatial queries because we have a table uh, that has um, a table of pizza locations and their latitude and longitude. We have the customers, their latitude and longitude, and now we can start pairing those two up, right? And the, the function that we're going to be using to pair these two up is called nearest neighbor. Okay, so Oracle has uh, this, these specialized functions that we use over our um, tables that have spatial, um, basically spatial coordinates. And then we also even build a spatial index on top of it to make the queries really fast on top of, on top of those tables, right? So here, let's do our first nearest neighbor query. So what we're doing is we're going to, uh, we'll just run it and then we'll explain it. I'm going to select the pizza chain, uh, its address, the city of that pizza chain in the state, and I'm going to base it on, well, I have my customer location, that customer is Latin long, and then I have the pizza locations, uh, latitude and longitude, right? And what I want to do is just return a single result. And this single result is that is Redwood Pizza Kitchen happens to be the nearest pizza location to this customer. Well, you know, let's say you want to find the top five. Change that to a five. Right? And now I have the top five pizza locations. And these are pizza locations that we're working with, right, for a promotion that are nearest to my customer. Okay, well, that's, that's cool. Maybe I want to know, well, <laughs> how far are they? Right, well, let's, let's start adding distance to it. And you can see that we're adding, um, that we're going to, we're going to add two things. One is, we'll do this in kilometers, and we'll return uh, one result per customer. And we have the distance function that we're now adding to our our query, our, our uh, spatial lookup, right? So now we know this Redwood Pizza Kitchen is actually 2.9 miles. So, so in you know this is kind of the value of in you could have a special set. Uh, you could use a specialized database for machine learning. You could use a specialized database for spatial, but you really want to combine. <laughs> Right? You always want to combine this stuff. So being able to do this all from within one environment is really, really useful. Right? Here's now the five top with the five top movie locations. Not movie locations, pizza locations, right? That are near and what are their distances. So maybe you know you can give them the choice. 
what what's nice is that you know you can continue to refine this right and and here we're going to say um again which question I'm, I'm looking for the query that has ah distance this is the one i was looking for you know if you want to say look i i only want to see results that are less than 10 kilometers well now we're not just doing it for a single customer but we're doing it for all customers that are in rhode island and here are pizza locations that are closest to a customer but it has it's only going to return the result if they're less than 10 kilometers away because frankly it doesn't really make sense to do a pizza you know promotion to someone who's 100 miles from a pizza place right they're not necessarily going to go there and by embedding this distance into the function as opposed to adding it to the where clause it's way more efficient right so you now have a super efficient way of finding those customers who we you know will now combine this with those who are potentially going to churn right and we can start saying give me my high value customers that are potentially going to churn and those who have um a location that's less than 10 kilometers away okay very cool right i'm now adding a spatial element but what should i recommend to them let's go to graph okay so now we're going to go back and do a graph analytic okay so let's go back to our service console and we're going to go to our tools and under tools you'll see graph studio So let's go, we're now on to lab number seven. And Graph Studio, we're gonna log in as our movie stream user. And this is kind of spinning up an environment. This might take a minute or two. And ahead of time, what we've done Remember when I said we, when we ran that script in the beginning on the data load process, what we did is we actually created a graph, right? And if you think about a graph, a graph is a different way of analyzing things. Let's, let, let's go into this and let's just load it into memory. So click on that graph. It's called movie recommendation. And make sure you have enough room here. So I have this graph called movie recommendations and we're going to load it into memory. You load, so you have a table in the database and just click yes. And this is going to take maybe two minutes. So you have this graph <clears throat> that's in a table and we're loading it into memory and we're going to be doing in memory analytics over that data. So we're going to be doing things like running a graph graph algorithm to say uh, who, uh, based on people in my community, what should I recommend next? So wh why does graph help? Well, the beauty of graph is that it's looking at the data, not in a tabular format necessarily, but how things connect to one another. In this case, we have what's called a bipartite graph where we have two types of vertices. You have a customer, that's one type, and you have a movie that they rent or they watch. So what's happening is you're making a connection, a watch connection, uh, of, uh, like a viewed, a viewed connection, a bot connection, uh, you know, different types of linkages between those different nodes, right? And if you think about it, you'll have, you'll, You'll have a connection. Melly has a connection to those graphs. Marcos has a connection to those, those movies, right? So you have these different customer nodes all pointing to these different movies or, you know, to the, or potentially the same movies, right? So you're building this whole web, this whole network of a, a graph of how things connect with one another. And now you can see patterns of, hey, I, I can see a pattern of communities based on connectivity, right? And now that I have a pattern based on that connectivity, you can look at things and say, well, 
you know, what if Melly and Mark, we're in the same community. What if Melly and Marcos watch that I haven't? Well, that might be something that's interesting for me to watch because it seems like we have similar tastes, right? So different graph algorithms to, to build out, uh, to, in this case, our, our movie recommendations. Okay, just like in, um, in machine learning, we have a notebook. Okay, so if you go to task three, and we'll go to the notebook tab here, we're gonna, task three, it says click here to download the notebook. So let's download that notebook. And I'm putting it into my local folder. Hey, Marty, just yeah. to let you know, you have about seven minutes left. Ah, okay. Pick it up speed. Yes. Let's, nah. <laughs> let's, let's pick that movie recommendation. I'll import it. And now I'm in my notebook. Okay. And in my notebook, we're going to say, look, we have a specialized query language just for graph that is somewhat SQL like. In this case, we're saying, look, I'm going to find for this customer, that's a vertex. And then you have an edge, which is connecting a vertex to another vertex, which is called movie. So here we have this vertex called uh, Ricky Rogers. And these are the movies that Ricky has purchased, right? And, and imagine now saying, well, I wanna say, look at movies that not just that Ricky has purchased, but Blanca has also purchased, and you're seeing how things build up, right? You're seeing how things interconnect with one another. And these how this is how relationships are formed. And it's this is what's looked at to figure out what should be recommended to customers. So we're going to use, uh, in this case, we're using the Java API. There's also a Python API over this. And we have great examples of using the Python API where we're getting a handle to that graph, right? And then we're saying, look, I'm gonna run a query over that. And we're gonna get that vertex for Ricky Rogers. And then finally, and I'm rushing through this, we're gonna run this algorithm that says whom to follow. So what movies are being watched in Ricky's community? that he hasn't necessarily watched. So here are uh, the people that are in his community, and that's what the whom to follow derived. These are the, the, the people. Sang Hoffman, Adriana Osborne, etc. Here's the movies that, that they've been watching. And based on that, we can now say, hey, we can recommend those to, um, to Ricky. Okay, so I, I kind of rushed through that, but you hopefully you get the picture, right? Because I, I really want to kind of wrap this up. But you, you can see how we're using relationships and connectivity to be able to form, in this case, different communities what these communities like, and then make recommendations based based on that, using a specialized language, which is just for that. Now, uh, we over already run our poll. Uh, th this was supposed to be asked afterwards, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, but, we can uh, run it again. We can launch it again, uh, Marty. Oh, can uh, you? Kevin, can you do it? Or, or I think you, you can do it yourself, uh, Marty. Yeah, we can do it. But I think what we can do is actually, as a matter of fact, well, then people, um, you have to go to the first two questions again, but um, let's do yeah, that. They... Okay, I, I'm hitting relaunch the poll. Yeah. Right. Oh, Perfect. did you already do it? Yeah. Okay, great. So it would be great for you guys. Please uh, run through that poll again. We'd really like to get your feedback. What do you think of it? Um, you know, do you think this is a good fit? Do you guys see like wanting to use these different types of analytic capabilities and c connecting ADB or autonomous database to your data lake and try to use that as an analytic engine. And frankly, it's not the only analytic engine. Of course, you're going to use Spark and you're going to use different types of analytic capabilities. Um, 
but you know the beauty of being able to do your analytics and again if you want to use spark for doing analytics we have specialized drivers for running spark against the database that are highly optimized right so use the languages that you want and the capabilities that you need to get you know better insights across your business so hopefully this is been helpful let me know if this was somewhat helpful to you or moderately i get the basics or yeah i'm ready to start using it and again you can run through the same workshop as well as there's probably 50 or so workshops just on autonomous database um we do have a, an event coming up so if you go to oracle.com slash events slash live run workloads your way on oci so that's coming up tomorrow so please jump in and Test your pie knowledge, right? You've got through all this. Jump on, go to bit.ly pie quiz dash 2022. And you can test your knowledge based on uh, this session and other sessions that you may have, uh, have partaken in. And then thank you, right? Again, uh, you could go back. If you haven't started your free trial, we have that for you. Um, we have an entire series called uh, on, of, of labs, this, this lab that we just went through is part of that series. So if you go to bit.ly slash get started with ADB, um, you can go there and you'll see a curated set of about 15 or so labs from, you know, get started with ADB in 10 minutes to, um, monitoring and managing or getting started with OML, right? So it really, there's, there's this high level one that we just went through, but also more like deeper dives right into the various capabilities and, and technologies. We have two minutes. Any, any questions out there? And thanks for doing the poll folks. If you haven't finished the, doing the poll, if you wouldn't mind. Just let me add, Marty. Um, I've also posted and put me. Let's have to put or focus on the chat. I've added the uh, link to the movie stream workshop series. So because oh, there you. are four more workshops that pick up the topic of movies of the movie stream company. So you have the direct link there. So find all of them, and then also the the homepage for Live Labs where you can know, find all the workshops or topics that you need. There are over three hundred currently live. So feel free to check those out as well. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you. I mean, this is a, this is a lot to, uh, we kind of went through a lot of topics. Hopefully you gained, uh, you know, you, you found it interesting and helpful and I just really appreciate you spending the time and I hope you have a great time with the rest of Pi Day. Thank yeah. you very much, everybody.